James Van Osdell here with Liz Fair, who's back in Chicago. The book that you just released is Horror Stories. And when we're talking horror, we're not talking monsters crawling out of the deep or serial killers. This is more horror like the calls coming from inside the house. <laughs> That's a great analogy. Yes, absolutely. It's... These are deeply personal yeah. recollections. They are. Let me take a step back. I remember back when Exile and Guyville came out, people were astonished, critical, the critics were, by how frank you were and how forthright you were and how personal you were. Seems crazy to think about now that it, it was such a conversation point back then that here's a woman being honest about things. But this, this feels even more deep and intense than anything you put on record. It possibly is. I mean, I would, I would think a lot of my best songs are actually very deep and personal. So I think it's just because it's, it's an expanded medium, you're, it's more immersive. So you're really into my life. Whereas with a song, there's music, there's other things to distract you. And you can think mm -hmm. about the lyrics, but a lot of it has other sort of protections. And this book is probably really raw and really, I mean, you're going to go in there with me and take a small, short journey. Well, you say very early on in the book, my motivation for writing this book is to articulate those experiences that people may not always want to recognize, but describe them in a way that makes them worth the effort. And there are parts throughout the book that I think people can key into and see themselves. Reflect I hope so. That was my aim. What I like, one of the things I like about your book, nonlinear. It's, these are vignettes from your life. In a sense, it almost feels like an album, like songs. It's, it's not, it's not a, there's not a through storyline. It's just each track or chapter is its own living, breathing thing, independent of the others. That intentional? That's exactly right. That's intentional. Um, I just found that that's what I am used to doing. That's how I organize my thoughts. When I make an album, I like to have songs of different emotions, different topics, kind of to complete the set of, it's almost like each album is where I'm at in my life right now. And so I give a rounded portrait of what's going on, the good, bad, you know, the everything. And I think this book, I organized it very much like an album. Each chapter, each vignette, each scene is its own separate immersive experience. I think people might be surprised if they're getting your book, expecting to hear in-depth background or analyses of your songs. There, there's not a whole lot about songwriting in here. Did you not want to write about that? I mean, if, for, for someone who picks up a Liz Fair memoir hoping to get background on divorce song or support system, they're not going to find it here. No. I've never even thought about writing about that because that wouldn't be very interesting to me. It's, it's interesting. I mean, I guess people want to know behind the scenes stories of the songs, but that kind of ruins it for you, whatever you think the association mm -hmm. is. But frankly, this is, this is my memoir is a two-parter. Random House bought two books. So this is the horror stories part. And the second part is fairy tales, which will follow. And my music isn't really, my songwriting process isn't tied to horror stories. Like, that's in the fairy tales. Interesting. The, but even, even in the fairy tales, I am not going to be telling you what each song is about and who it's about. Like, that's not of any interest to me, really. The book starts with She Lies. This is a tough way to open, or as a reader, it was, holy crap. You write about a girl who's on the floor, not really sure what happened to her, but it, it wasn't good. And it, it kind of reminded me, and I, this is one of those things I think people can key into or relate to. Sometimes when you see something potentially horrific, your mind tells you it's not as bad as it is, or it tries to tell you that it's something completely opposite of what you're actually witnessing. Can you explain? I think that story in particular is an exploration of what happens when we don't act, when we should act and we don't act. And you're right, there's a sense of shock and there's also that thing that you do where you, you take your cue from everyone around you. And I hate to think that that's how I was affected at that time. That's why I've struggled with that story for so long and why it's lingered in my memory. Because I don't like to think of my, some, myself as someone that goes along with the pack. Right. And I don't think anyone would think of me that way. But in that instance, I was so wrapped up that whole first semester at college with trying to look like I knew what I was doing, not trying to look out of place, 
doing everything the way everyone else was doing it. I had been like un, in a boot camp of training to just sort of take my cues from everyone else, like in the cafeteria line or at the library. I didn't know how to get the books out or every single thing that I did that semester, I was trying to take my cues from everyone else. And then this happened. And I knew at the time that I should do something, but I didn't actually feel that sense of personal power to take the leadership position to do anything. And it really haunts me. It haunts me to this day, obviously. So I, I, I would imagine songwriting is its own form of catharsis. This, was this kind of a, a cleansing experience for you, putting all this stuff on paper? In a way, I didn't write it to make it cathartic. I wrote it to uh, counteract what I was feeling as I was watching the 2015, 2016 campaigns. I think I needed, I was very upset by what was happening in the country and I kept feeling like um, honesty and um, I just, I felt like I needed to put down what I believed in and what I had experienced in life, the personal. Yeah. I'm trying to direct your attention to the personal. And I'm trying to grapple with mistakes that I've made and continue to make. And I'm trying to come to terms with how can you say you're a good person <clears throat> if you've failed in all these ways? And how can you say someone else is a bad person without looking at yourself? I'm going to jump around uh, in a nonlinear way. seems only appropriate. Hold this for me. You're on a plane. You're enjoying, to some extent, the trappings of fame, the first class, the, the attention on a, on a plane. You find out a guy is on the flight who you grew up with, and the position you take in, in this recollection is, oh, maybe I can cheer him up. Maybe he's depressed. You, you knew something had happened to him earlier. And as it turns out, it, it puts you in your place. Like, he's doing perfectly fine. He's an athlete. He, he, he was in an accident in Boston, and you were kind of cocky in the way you recounted it. And then he just kind of... Disarmed me completely. Yeah. And it, it, our roles reversed because in my mind, I was thinking that I was the star and he was someone that I could help. And in the end, I ended up helping him and he was the star. And it was just this great perspective shift mm -hmm. that, that, you know, the tall, that knocked me down to size really quickly. And I never forgot it. I never forgot that, you know, don't take yourself so seriously and certainly don't take stardom too seriously. I think that's, being from the Midwest, isn't that kind of built into your DNA somewhat? Yes, Self-deprecation? Yeah, but I struggle against that because I, I don't really like that about the Midwest. I like that people are real, and but I do think the Midwest could uh, stand to, you know, plump itself up a little bit more. You know, it's okay to say like, hey, this is what's happening here and we're awesome. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, I already had cynical unkind thoughts about the record industry and to some extent the radio industry. Uh, you underscored all of that with the hashtag chapter, life in the Me Too era. Uh, it, it, it was not easy for you navigating through the, the machinations of the record business. I mean, you were, all the horror stories we hear happened to you. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it wasn't First of all, there was no internet, so we didn't know what everyone else was experiencing. We didn't have a public forum to discuss all these things. Right. And at the same time, if you're an ambitious young woman, you want to keep taking opportunities when you can to further your career and establish yourself. And as far as I knew, that was normal. Guys were trying to hit on you all the time. It was just like a gauntlet you had to run. And I didn't, I knew, I knew it was bad <clears throat> I just didn't know if everyone else was getting it too. I kind of assumed that the rock and roll business would be a little bit full of gamblers and thieves and pimps. <laughs> it seemed like if you're going to go that direction and, you know, not just stay in your small community, you were going to encounter that, you mm -hmm. know. And I thought I could handle it, and at various times I could, and at various times I couldn't. But the interesting thing to me about that is, is I never told anybody these experiences, Apart from Not a even couple manager of those. Or? No, no. I didn't know who was on which side. Which is a scary thing as you're making your way through the professional world. Yeah. I mean, if, take the perspective young men are trained by their fathers to enter the work world, that everyone expects them to do so. But I'm old enough that that wasn't a given when I was mm. young. And to choose to do something 
not just, you know, that already was populated by females, you know, to go into a male-dominated culture and try to compete along with them put me in harm's way a lot of the time. So was Lilith an oasis for you in the late 90s? Was that like, oh, thank God, no slimy dudes? Yes. I say that Lilith Fair gave me another at least decade lease on my interest and passion for being in the music business. That's interesting. Yeah, I think at, at, at that point I might have turned away and said, this is too much, I can't do it. And seeing that gave me hope that there was a brighter future. Talk about a little bit about your relationship with fame. I mean, because it comes across in a couple uh, parts of the book, the detachment of Liz Fair product and Liz Fair person. I mean, you describe yourself as super reclusive when you're not on stage or in public. Is, is that it? Did I just summarize? I mean, I don't, I don't know. Super right. reclusive isn't the right word because I'm definitely social outside of my career. I just, Virtual I'm very, is, very yeah. happy to hang out in my home and just, I've, I mean, I have good parents, and I was raised in a strong community, and I just, I've known a lot of people that have done incredibly amazing things. I mean, my father saved lives at various points in his career. I've never done that. You know, I'm making music. So I don't think of, I didn't come from a culture that said stardom is your ultimate goal. Mm -hmm. If anything, I think it was frowned upon or seen as not particularly tasteful to, to do that. Right. That's not like a given yay for you. It might, it might, a lot of people warned me not to do it. And I mean, to that extent or to that end, back in the 90s when Guyville broke, it wasn't cool to have rock star aspirations. I mean, just in your specific industry, I mean, there was that, that line that was drawn that, that you have to be pure of artistic spirit and you can't want to be the next Nirvana. Billy Corgan, I remember, was scrutinized for ha- wanting to be the biggest star in the world. Which, if you break it down, there's nothing wrong with wanting to be successful in your chosen vocation. <laughs> but it, it was really like black and white back then, the way thing, the lines were drawn. Well, because I was there hanging out, I think they assumed that I espoused the same values that they did. But I didn't. And I found the guyville of the Wicker Park music scene to be just as repressive as any mainstream guy world. And I didn't feel such an allegiance to it Mm -hmm. as I might have if I were a male who had specifically gone there to be a part of indie rock. I wanted to make art, I wanted to make music, but I wasn't involved in the political, you know, uh, tussle between, you know, this pure of heart thing is a little bit, I mean, (laughs) I... I don't know anyone in that old scene who was pure of heart in any (laughs) respect. And I think if they had had success, they would have eagerly taken it as well. I think people like Steve Albini did have standards, things he would and wouldn't do. And there were a lot of people like that. I also had things that I would and wouldn't do. They just weren't the same as theirs. So why a bunch of guys would think that I would come into this world and just uh, sign up and sign my allegiance away to them I don't know going back staying in that era for just another I liked the radio I didn't understand you know I grew up going to concerts and loving songs on the radio and I would have liked to be on the radio sticking with that era for a second and back when Guyville came out I mean it really your album uh, Siamese Dream Saturation from Urge Overkill that was like the holy trinity what that sparked off I mean you I'm sure you remember all too well Back then, Billboard magazine, because of your album and their albums, labeled Chicago the cutting edge's new capital. And after that, all of a sudden, it was like, yes, all of a sudden it was record label Palooza. Bands who were just walking out of the garage one day were getting signed the next. It was nuts. Do you, how do you reflect on, I hate using the word legacy because you're a young, vibrant artist, but how do you perceive your legacy from that era? Well, Nirvana really changed it for everybody. I think Mm -hmm. that's what started off that. And being a hunger, and zeroing in on Chicago specifically. Sure. Yes. Okay. Um, my legacy, as far as I can tell, I-, I was on a continuum as far as I see it, uh, of female artists being outspoken and frank and daring to lead a band. And I do see a lot of young female artists that um, reach out to me. We reach out to each other on social media. And I think I did give them. Uh, an example of someone that was not technically the best player, not technically the best singer, but had something to say and was very creative 
and I made my way. So I think that gave permission to a lot of other young female artists or people that aspire to work in the industry. Anytime you see more people doing it that are like you, it gives you a sense that you too can accomplish it. Sure. It's just, it's a role model thing, I think. And I hope I've been that. I hope that's part of what I've left behind in a legacy. Looking ahead, I mean, taking something from that legacy, your work with Breadwood back in the early days, fantastic stuff. You're working with Breadwood again. <laughs> yeah, that, well, that, you know, we put out that reissue of my first record with all of the girly sound tapes, which were the um, bedroom pop that I made on a four track, a cas you know, a cassette recorder. Back in the 90s, you couldn't find these anywhere. They were bootlegged all over the They were bootlegged. They were, they're, they're very the rare lost tapes. And mm -hmm. a lot of the Guyville songs were born from a rewrite of an earlier girly, girly, girly sound song. And um, so when we did this and we really kind of tied up the past in this beautiful packaging and everybody had their say and all these pictures that had never been seen before, it made me think about that time and I was nostalgic and I was curious to see what Brad and I would sound like all these years you know, later. Mm -hmm. What kind of music would we sound like if we made it? And we have a hint of that now. Yeah. And full album to come? Yes, full album. And it's been, it's been a it's little bit. It's basically finished. <laughs> really? Yeah. So when do we get to hear the whole um, thing? I may throw one more song on, and we have some bells and whistles. But uh, I don't know. It's up to management, <laughs> really. So is it kind of, kind of like a... It's early 2020. That I know. But with you and Brett, it's just, it, it's just comfortable, like riding a bike again, like getting back Pretty on Pretty much. Bike. We were very surprised. It took us a minute to find what... what I had a vision for what I wanted to do. I wanted it, I kept saying I didn't want it to sound like anything else. I threw Old Town Road at him and I was like, listen, this is not a traditional structure and this is the number one song in America and it's like two minutes long. We can do whatever we want, you mm -hmm. know? And, and the music business has changed so much. I so don't much. have to shoot for radio. I can just be as weird and quirky as I want. Which you, you certainly... And I'm bringing some of the stuff that I did when I was composing for television, the soundscapes. I'm putting some of that in there. The structures are really weird, but I'm also chasing a hooky, you know, rock or pop song or a sad, quiet song, just like I always did. And we have that jazzy thing that Brad and I get into. Mm -hmm. We're both using the skills that we've learned in the interim, bringing it to bear on our work now. But at the same time, there's something very familiar about the sounds we like and the effects that we want to put on, and which it does work very well. And I think everything you just said speaks to the fact that people shouldn't have expectations going into a Liz Fair project, whether it's the book, whether it's your albums. You're going to follow your muse, and we shouldn't have preconceived notions because you might take us somewhere completely different. You'd be less angrier if you <laughs> didn't make preconceived no I like to surprise people it's I think it's it's what I enjoy I like being surprised by an artist I remember when Kid A came out and everyone was angry about that album I thought it was the most delightful thing I'd ever heard I thought it was the most exciting inspirational it carved new territory who doesn't want to go into that territory that they just conquered it was See, brilliant I remember, that. I, I remember that as feeling like a perfectly normal really? evolution from Kid A or from uh, OK Computer well, I mean, maybe, yeah, either way, I'm down for future exploration. I'm down for stuff you haven't seen before and trying things that I've never done before. Love it. Okay, so Horror Stories is the book, available everywhere. A fantastic recollection. Like I said, we can read that and see ourselves reflected in those stories, which is really neat. And the fact that you are willing to just put it all out there, whether you're talking about childbirth, by the way, glamorous process. <laughs> I think in the book what you see is that I'm not writing from the rock star point of view. No. I'm writing as a human being who happens to do that for a living. And then Fairy Tales is next year? Fairy Tales, well, hopefully, right? Get writing, Liz. Scribble, uh -huh. scribble. Yeah, get that going. But you're, yes. You're busy. I'm busy. I saw, I saw the book project as a yin-yang. So this is sort of the dark stories, the subconscious, the sexual, the you know, regret, shame, with the bright spot of hope, inspiration, and beauty. And then fairy tales is all the glamorous, big rock and roll experiences, like the music biz stuff, mm -hmm. with the center of disquietude and unsettling subtext. Sold. Woo! Liz Fair. <laughs>